Here's the deal. I'm going to let you guys know something up front. The next few minutes are going to be a bit challenging. But if you're open to a challenge, behind every challenge is a greater hope and a greater sense of victory and a greater identity in Christ. The doorway is a challenge, but what you get on the other side of that door is so glorious and so amazing. So I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to pray for us. Open your hearts and minds to be willing to hear a challenge, not from me, but from God's Word and by His Spirit. Because all this month, if you haven't been here, all this summer, we have been looking at the book of Acts and being empowered by God so that we don't have to be weak, we don't have to be frail, we can be strong, we can have faith and victory. But one of the ways that the Bible teaches that that happens, a very clear way in the book of Acts, is that we get the strength of the Lord, we are empowered when we go into the world. It's when we go into those places out there, those people out there, that God's strength and power comes on us. So how we see the world, the heart that we have for the world, for the people who ridicule us, for the family members who hurt you, how you see them, how you think about them, greatly determines whether or not you walk in the power of God for them and for your own life. We're going to study that. Let's come before the Lord. Jesus, we thank you that you have only our best interest in mind, that you want us to grow and to develop, that you have a calling for us, an identity for us. Spirit of God, we pray over these next few minutes that you would teach us through your word. We open ourselves to a challenge because we want to know you more. We want to experience you greater. I thank you for each person who is here, those who are watching online, those on the plaza, Lord, every one of us. Speak to us uniquely and specifically. We open our hearts and minds. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Here's the challenge. The more society is shifting away from what was kind of biblical, Christ-centered values for life, the more there is a separation between those of us who call ourselves Christians and those of us who are not Christians. The more there's a difference in how we look at life, what we look at values. And all of us now interacting with those people become far more difficult. The condition of our heart towards them becomes far more difficult. And yet, as we said earlier, you experience the power of God when you go into the world. There's all through the book of Acts. Jesus said, listen, signs and wonders will follow you when you're in the world. You'll see the power of God take place in ways beyond your control. He said, I'm going to give you power so you will be my witnesses. And oftentimes, as the world and the church is more and more separating in its identity, the tendency is for the church to hide out. And we actually think hiding out will give us greater a power and identity. But the Bible says, no, no, when you go into the world... That's when you're really going to discover my presence and my power. But that becomes a challenge for us in our hearts. And there's a story in the book of Acts we're going to look at about two blind men. These two blind men needed to have a change take place, but in different ways. We are one of the blind men. In order to understand this story, I've got to give you some background. So the church started in the first century only in Jerusalem, and it was predominantly Jews. So these Jews became Christ followers. Well, the Jewish leaders were very much uh, afraid and threatened by what they were doing. There was one Jewish leader especially who was incredibly passionate about shutting down the church. His name was Saul. And Saul would take Christians and he would imprison them and he would be brutal and terrorize them, torture them. And his reputation spread throughout the church that he was an evil, anti-Christ kind of individual because he was, and he was devout in this. He even got permission from his supervisors to take his campaign against the church outside of Jerusalem into other cities. And one day he is traveling to another city to go and terrorize Christians, and on the road he meets Jesus. And it's such a dynamic, dramatic, intense experience Saul can't quite figure it out. He literally physically goes blind because of this bright light, and he ends up in this house, and he's going, what's going on? Everything is upside down now, and he doesn't know quite what's going to happen next, sitting in the house. Now, over here is a guy by the name of Ananias. You and I, we're Ananias. He's just a disciple. He didn't follow Christ as an apostle. As far as we know, he's not one of the leaders in the church. He's just 
an everyday Christian like you and I are. But there's a shift that goes on in the book of Acts. At the very beginning, you had a couple of key leaders like Peter, and they would stand up like I'm doing, and they would preach to thousands, and people would get saved. By the time we get to Ananias, it's changed. Now you all are doing the work of the Lord, not just me. Everybody's going out. Everybody's going into the world. Everybody's going to their neighbors. And here's Ananias, and God comes to Ananias, and he taps him on the shoulder. He says, Ananias, I want you to be a part of what I'm doing in the life of Saul. And God comes to you, and he taps you on the shoulder. He says, I want you to be a part of what I'm doing in the life of fill in the blank. But Ananias knows Saul, and he knows his reputation. And he's going, no. And he reminds God of everything that's gone bad with this guy. He cannot see God at work in his life. And that's where we fit into the story of Ananias. Because every one of us has a soul in our life. Somebody we know who has created pain for us, who lives their life in such an anti-Christ way, who carries out an evil or immorality, and God comes and he taps us on the shoulder. He says, Joel, I want you in life. I'm going, are you crazy? We have what I call is a probably not list. Do you know what a probably not list is? That person that you're thinking of right now, your Saul, if I came to you after the service and I said, hey, do you think that person will get saved by the end of the year? Eh, probably not. <laughs> Ananias had this Probably not, list. it's not going to be him. And God brings about a change in Ananias so that Ananias can experience all that God is doing, not just in Saul's life, but in his life. Because right now, every one of us has that person. And we've lost hope. We're scared for what their life may look like. We're frustrated sometimes at their decisions. There's a measure of despair. When we pray, it's more anguish than faith. And this morning, God wants to tap you on the shoulder. And if anything you hear, it's this. He wants to remind you, I'm at work in that daughter's life. I'm at work in that coworker's life. I'm at work in that neighbor's life. I am at work. But we need to have the scales taken off. So we can see and know how God is working and how he wants us to participate. So let's look at the story starting in Acts chapter 9. We're going to see two blind men here. And we're going to answer three questions. Why are we blind? What should we see? And how do we get sight? Here's the first question. Why are we blind? Look at verse 10 of Acts chapter 9. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord called him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. And asked for a man named Tars, from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered. Now see how he responds? I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. He has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Ananias talks to God and he says, listen, I've had personal experience Maybe Ananias had an uncle in Jerusalem who was now sitting in a dungeon, bleeding and broken, directly as a result of Saul. Oftentimes, that individual in our life has created a personal hurt for us. It's a friend, it's a family member, and their attitude and their action creates this pain in us, and we begin to define who they are by the pain they've created in our life. We're just like Ananias. And we can only see the present. And Ananias comes to God and kind of argues with him. Goes, no, no, he's creating all this hurt. And look at what he's doing now. And that's how we see we are blind to God's work because we are defining them and our relationship with them by the pain that's created in our heart. And even worse than that, we begin to judge them by that. Now, the Bible says that at there are times in life you have to make judgments, good judgments a judgment that you make as a parent for your children so that you can give them good decisions. When you have a friend who has gone off the rails and is involved in you know, life-destructive activity, you have to make that judgment so you can intervene and help them. But the Bible also talks a great deal about a wrong kind of judgmental heart. 
And this is the kind of heart that Ananias has. And oftentimes, this is the kind of heart that we can have. When we look at that individual who has created pain for us or is acting in a way that is so contrary to Christ and there is a difficulty there and we quickly judge them. And to understand this, you have to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden because this was the origin of sin. God creates Adam and Eve and he basically says, you can eat anything you want to eat. You can do pretty much anything you want to do. Build a life, flourish, reproduce. Oh, one rule, do not eat from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. What is it about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that is wrong? Is it just a random rule? God says this one tree, because this tree represents the ability, the desire, the heart to judge like God's judge. You will know good, you will know evil, you will make that judgment. And the enemy comes to Adam and Eve and says, listen, eat. He's already, they've already been made in God's image, and yet the temptation is you could be like God. They've been made to love like God, but they are not God. They're created by God. So God says, here's the one thing that differs. I'm the one who judges. You don't. Don't eat of the tree. And yet they're tempted to do that. So they go and they eat of this tree and they begin to judge. And since then, through the centuries, we've seen this symptom where we judge wrongly. They judge God. They think he's not really interested in their best well-being. Even when he comes back and talks to them, they keep judging him. We do the same thing. When we question God, now God in his goodness and his grace says, come talk to me, come talk to me. But we got to understand, we are judging God. They judge themselves. They see all this shame. They got to cover themselves up. We do the same thing, usually on two extremes. We judge ourselves, so every time we look in the mirror, we're covered with shame, or we judge ourselves and we have all this pride. Rarely is our judgment accurate, but more than ever, they judge each other. She did it, he did it. And you see this throughout the centuries where this theme of judgment perceives itself where we're judging others. I have no tattoos. A guy with all kinds of tattoos walks by, I'm tempted to judge him. A single mom with three kids who are just crazy, and you see them in the grocery store, a thought goes through your mind, you're judging that single mom. We find ourselves at all kinds of times, old guy with a leisure shoot, I should have worn a leisure shoot, it would have been a living illustration, you would all judge me, me in a leisure shoot. <laughs> if we're honest, we have to start from the reality that we are tempted to judge people in a way that we were never called to judge people. And when we do that to the people who are in our world who do not know yet Christ, the difficulty is this, it removes us, like Ananias, from being able to see what God's doing in their life. All we can see is everything that's wrong with them. And we live in that kind of judgment. But the Bible teaches really clearly, we don't have the ability to judge. We don't have the knowledge. We don't know everything that's going on. We're not aware of all of that. I did a project years ago when communism first fell in the Soviet Union, and it was in Russia because there were so many street kids. And I was working with churches in Moscow to feed these street kids. And so I took a pastor over with me to see the project, and we went there late at night because that's when the feeding would take place. And all these street kids come out and they all have brown paper bags because that's their glue and they sniff their glue to stay high. And then they eat their meal and they go back to wherever they're just living on the streets. And the pastor was with me and he said, he said, wait a minute, Joel, why don't they make those kids get rid of their bags of glue before they feed them so they're not sniffing glue? And I said, you know, that's a fair question. He wasn't judging the kids. He was judging the Russian ministry doing this. I said, tomorrow night, when we go out to see the program again, don't wear a jacket. Just don't wear a jacket. He said, why? I, just trust me, don't wear a jacket. And I said, and don't wear a hat. Don't wear any gloves, don't wear any scarf. I want you to dress like these kids are dressed. Wear a shirt, wear pants, 30 below. So he was willing to do it and he went out there. In the first 15 minutes, this pastor was so cold, so frigid, he came up and he said, Joel, please let me borrow your jacket. I said, no. I want you to look at these kids. And I want you to look at the hell they live through every day. He came back to me a half hour later. He said, God has given me such a heart of compassion for these kids. I know now 
why these Russian ministry leaders let them sniff their glue and still give them food. He needed his heart changed so he could see what was going on differently. We don't have that kind of knowledge. Oftentimes when we are judging, we are doing it without any knowledge. We're doing it out of our frame of reference like Ananias. Because you're not like me, I'm judging you. And I'm going to judge you, and I'm going to judge you, and these thoughts run through my mind. And I don't see God at work because you're not like me. Parents with kids, this happens all the time. We don't have the knowledge. We don't have the purity of heart. When Jesus talked about this one time, he said, listen, before you take the speck out of somebody else's eye, take the big stinking plank out of your own eye. It was the same item. It was the same component. Because here's why. Oftentimes when we judge, we judge against the very issue we're going through. And we're going through it and we impose it on somebody else and we begin to judge that way where we don't actually have the purity of heart. If I judge them, it makes me feel about where I'm at. If I judge you, then I feel more holy. Ananias has this issue. He is judging Saul based upon his frame of reference, based upon what he knows in the external, based upon his own pain, and he's a picture of where we're at. We don't judge, the Bible says, mainly, most importantly, because we don't have the authority to judge. We are not king. So it's not my place to judge. That's why the tree was there. In this time, I am not to be judging people. I'm supposed to be a window of grace to them. Basically, there are two schools of thought. God created humanity or humanity created God. If humanity created God, meaning in ancient world, when they didn't understand what was going on, they needed a way to navigate things they couldn't control, the sun, the rain, diseases, because they didn't have health care. So they created the idea of God. And that gave them the ability to navigate what they didn't control. Humanity created God. But now humanity has evolved so much, our science, our health care, so much, we don't really need God. We can get rid of God. And you see that happening in society. And when God is gone, you become the judge, because you're God now. And it's kind of fascinating to me that we live in a society that wants to be branded by we don't judge anybody, and yet all they do is judge all the time. <laughs> Every post on social media is judging. Now listen, here's the deal though. If you believe that God created humanity, then you realize God's job description is judge, not my job description. This kind of judgment we're talking about, the attitude of my heart. So if I'm going to see God work in me, empower me, if I'm going to be used by him, it's got to start with an honest recognition. Do I have this attitude in my heart? Am I blind like Ananias was? Is there a probably not list that stops me from seeing God's activity and God's work? Because if my heart is judgmental, I will never see God at work. God tells Ananias, Saul is praying. Ananias doesn't hear it. Can I tell you something? That person on your probably not list, God is so at work in their life. He is actively working. He is pursuing, and he wants to tap you on the shoulder, but it begins by recognizing, wow, I'm blind. So what should we be seeing? Look at verse 15. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. There are three characteristics given that God is saying, Ananias, you gotta see this in this person. And I think the story is there for us. We need to see these people with these three characteristics. First of all, he's my chosen instrument. That individual who you'd say, probably not this year, Joel. God is saying, I have such a plan, such a destiny, such a purpose for that individual. we got to see them in that light. And you go, that's really hard to do. But God's given us two sets of eyes. You have the eyes in your head, which are your natural way of seeing, which is oftentimes why we stay here judging. But then you have what's called the eyes of your heart, which is looking through eyes of faith as to what God is doing and seeing how God does this. Let, let me ask you this question. Let's say you're walking along the park, and you see in a tree, underneath a tree, a 22-year-old guy stoned out of his mind, just stinks because he hasn't showered for a week, hair ratted down to his elbows, just completely lost. You walk past him. One thought is, oh gosh, move my kids far away from him. What a disgrace. 
As a Christian, you may have pity. Oh, that's too bad. That's such a shame. God's saying neither one of those are right. He's saying you look at that 22-year-old under the tree and you go, there sits God's chosen instrument. There is somebody who could be a pastor. There is somebody who could be used by God. Why? Because that 22-year-old is Bayless Conley. Would you have seen Bayless Conley if that was the 22-year-old? Because that's how his life started. And now we're here and there's Cottonwood Church and there's these ministries around the world because somebody had to say, that's God's chosen instrument. We begin to see that person. That's just not a sad case. That's a public school teacher who can change thousands of kids' lives. That's a nurse who will bring compassion here. That's a judge who will bring justice to our society. He says, you've got to see people as a chosen instrument, not just see them with pity or even compassion, but see them with destiny and purpose. You look through the eyes of faith. Now you're beginning to see God's spirit come on you as you begin to see that person. But he goes on. He says, it's not just a chosen instrument. They will carry my name. Saul will no longer destroy my name. He will now carry my name. You don't just see their purpose and their destiny. You actually see that they have this identity. And their identity is being a Christ follower. You have this amazing identity with God because of his love. Uh, the other day, I don't know if this happens to you, but I get a lot of junk mail. I don't know how they get my name, and it follows me where I go. So I get all this junk mail, and I literally get the mail out of the mailbox, and I stand over my recycle bin, and I just throw all this junk mail away. And I was going through it, and there was this flyer, and this, but just a piece of paper, and on one side of the flyer was some advertisement, some junk mail, so I threw it away. But as it floated down to the recycle bin, before it landed, it flipped. So I saw the other side of the flyer. On the other side of the flyer was a picture of a teenage girl who had been missing for three or four years with a phone number. Have you seen her? For me, it was a piece of junk mail with a picture that meant nothing. But in that moment, immediately, I began to think there is a mom somewhere who has not slept for three years, wondering, where is my daughter? There is a dad somewhere. Is she OK? When will she come home? Is she safe? And as I sat there, stood there in my garage over the recycle bin, God gave me an insight into his heart. For those people who we disdain, for those people that we're disgusted by, for those people who have a tendency to want to judge, he gave me an insight into his heart for them. Like God is saying, where is my son? Where is my daughter? When will my daughter, when will my son come home? When will they be safe? And he gave me this insight into who they are that I need to see them because when I know God loves that person in my world that much, I can have a confidence he is active. He's doing something. He is working hard. And he comes and he taps me on the shoulder and says, Joel, I want you involved. But it begins with the condition of your heart. Do you see them as a chosen instrument? Do you see them in their identity, in love with me and my love for them? But then he adds this third characteristic. He says, this Saul, he's going to have to suffer. Well, what does that mean? Yes, he's talking about what Saul's life will look like, but I think he's telling Ananias and he's telling us, we have got to have a vision for these people that is greater than just this earth. They have to have this kingdom identity because here's what can happen for us. As Christians, we're going, okay, I've got people in my world and they don't know Christ and they're creating pain in me. They're creating hardship for me. They're creating difficulty at the workplace or in my society or in my neighborhood or in my very family. And all we hope for is that they'll just become Christianish. You know, Christianish, just kind of do a little bit of what a Christian would do and we'll be thrilled. Do not settle for those people becoming Christian-ish. Do not settle that they make our faith easier or lighter. They have a destiny and an eternity, and what they will do for God, what they will do for the kingdom, we go, I am not going to settle for being Christian-ish. I want you to become Christ-like. I want you to know Jesus and the power of his death and the power of his resurrection. So here I am, and I'm Ananias, and I've got that individual 
It's a family member, and they're creating an enormous amount of pain for me because they don't have a faith. And I'm tempted to judge them. God taps me on the shoulder and says, Joel, I want you to know my power, my strength, my faith, my compassion, my grace. See them differently. See them as a chosen instrument with a purpose. See them in an identity of love. See them with an eternity, not just with some habit changes in the short term. If that's how I'm supposed to see them then, the question becomes, how do I get God's sight? How does this change actually, actually take place for me? Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 17. Here's how the story ends. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Learn from the example of Ananias. First thing God says to Ananias is you got to go to him. Now, we know in the New Testament, there are many miracles that God does without the proximity of closeness. He's doing this for Ananias. Ananias, you will never see me at work in Saul's life. You will never see me at work in other people's lives until you make the journey into their house, until you go into their world. And God says, Ananias, you got to go in there. you got to place hands on them. This is the example of what God did. While we were yet sinners, he came to us and came into our house and placed his hands on us. When we do that, then we see him. But here's the challenge. I don't like the world. I don't like the way they mock my Lord. I don't like the way they influence my kids away from God. I don't like the way they judge me and say that I am this horrible, bigoted person. I don't like the world. And because I don't like the world, I am tempted to remove myself from the world, to isolate myself, to hang out with you all, because you like me. Well, some of you like me. You like me. And because I don't like the world, I will remove myself from the very people God has called me to go to. Yeah. And when I go to them, I experience his power. I think that by removing myself from the world, that's where I'm really going to be able to be a strong Christian. And the book of Acts says, no, you want the power of God? you got to go into the world. Ananias, go to Saul's house. you got to go into the world. you got to touch them. you got to be with them. And then you discover this grace. I could forgive that person. I could never forgive them before. But now that I've gone into their world, wow, there was this grace to forgive them. That's the power of God. I could speak to them, and I could say things that influence them. I could never do that before, because you can't do that from a distance through social media posts. You can do that when you're sitting with them, talking to them. you got to do this. And it happens in every environment. I learned this with my son. When my son turned 12 or 13, he did idiotic stuff like every 12 or 13-year-old boy does, right? So I sit down with him. But the first time I sit down with him to talk to him, we do it face to face. He comes into my world. He comes into my office, and we sit down, and we talk face to face, and it was a complete disaster. He didn't hear anything. He didn't say anything, because I was making him come into my world when I would tell him everything that was right, and I couldn't see God at work, because I was removed. God says, Ananias, go into Saul's world, and what you will see is me at work. So the next time, I went into my son's world. And I sat next to him on the couch and we watched a football game because I learned this lesson, dads. Face to face with your son, not nearly as effective as shoulder to shoulder. Because when you are shoulder to shoulder and you're both looking, there is a tendency for them to talk. And when the football game we watched was always the Chicago Bears and they were horrible. So there was a lot of time to talk with each other. <laughs> I had to go into his world. The moment I got into his world, I knew, wow, God's at work here. There's stuff going on here. You cannot remove yourself. You cannot stay in that place of judgment. you got to have those scales fall off where you see them in a new way. He says, go in there. But he doesn't just go in there. When he goes into the house, here's what he says. Brother Saul, earlier in the story, when he talks to God, that man is how he calls him. Now he calls him Brother Saul. He is declaring an identity over him. This is what we're supposed to do. 
We declare this identity over who they are, who God is making them to be. There's this great story in the New Testament of what happened to Jesus. He's walking along and the religious leaders come up to him and they have a woman who's been caught in adultery. And they got stones. They're gonna stone her. And they want Jesus to join in stoning her. And he doesn't hardly say anything. But he kneels down and he begins to write in the dust. The story doesn't tell us what he's writing, but the moment he writes this, the religious leaders disappear. But I think I know what he's writing. I think he's writing their names in the dust because the prophet Jeremiah spoke about this. Look at the screens, Jeremiah 17, 13. Here's what it says. Lord, you are the hope of Israel. Those who turn away from you will have their names written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord the spring of the living water. These religious leaders were supposed to be bringing living water, grace and forgiveness and restoration to this woman, but all they're doing is they got stones. And we have this temptation to replace springs of living water with stones. And Jesus writes their names, and the moment they see that, they think about the prophet Jeremiah, and they run away. And then the second strange thing that's happened is he talks to this woman as a picture for us, and here's what he says to the woman in t verses 10 and 11 of John 8. When Jesus had stood up, saw no one was, but the woman was there, he said to her, woman, where are your accusers? No one has, has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now listen to what he says. He says, I'm not condoning your sin, but I'm not condemning you. How can you say both those things? I don't condone you, I don't condemn you. Because religion says this, if I don't condemn you, it means I'm condoning you. So I gotta condemn you. Amen. And we are tempted sometimes to have that influence of religion, I'm gonna condemn you, because I don't wanna condone you. Jesus says, I don't condone you, go and sin no more, but I don't condemn you. That is the definition of grace. Grace is God saying, listen, you gotta grow. You can't live like this, but grace is saying, I came here to save you, not to condemn you. I came here to heal you and to restore you. And this is what Ananias is doing. He walks in and he goes, Brother Saul. He's calling out his identity. That person on your probably not list, you gotta start to call out their identity when you see them. You gotta say, wow. You are a child of God. You have a purpose, you have a destiny. You begin to speak that out, like Ananias is speaking out, and you will see God at work in their life, and you will see the power of God on you. The story ends, and these scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he was baptized. He's saying, Ananias, I'm doing something over here. Would you be part of a miracle? Would you experience my power in a way that will blow everybody away? Because this Saul turns into Paul and writes a chunk of the New Testament. Starts this whole ministry, plants churches all over the place. Ananias, I know you're just a regular disciple, but would you be part of the miracle? And he comes to each and every one of us and he's tapping us on the shoulder. Would you be part of my miracle in that person's life? Would you join me? Don't judge them. That's not your job, that's my job. See them as a chosen instrument, carrying my name with this eternity. Would you speak and declare over them my identity? And if you do that, you will discover a power for grace and an authority and a compassion and a love and all of the things that have separated you will be broken down and you will be there in their world like Jesus came into our world for us. Would you do that? He taps you on the shoulder. Here's what I would like to do. We're gonna close this by giving you a moment with the Lord. Because if we're honest, we probably all have a probably not list. And if we're honest, we all at times have a proclivity to judge in the wrong way. Other people who have created pain for us, who are hurting the church, who mock Christians, who have made our life difficult. And in this moment, I believe the Spirit of God 
wants to have the scales fall off of our eyes the way it did for Ananias, wants to move us into his power and his goodness. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I just want you to close your eyes. Just follow me as I walk you through this just for a moment. I want you to think of that person. Whoever that person is, after the first service, a bunch of people came up to me and were talking about their person. I am very sorry for the pain and the hurt that you have experienced. I truly am. But if you're willing to take your eyes off of that and onto Jesus, you will discover a comfort, and a love, and a compassion. So as you are thinking about that person, here's what I would like you to do just for a moment. The Bible talks about us praying blessing and gratitude for those who are against us. Maybe you've never done this, and this is where it would be a step of faith. Would you thank the Lord for that person right now? Would you ask the Lord to bless that person? Jesus taught, pray blessing even on your enemies. And even as you are willing to make that prayer, the Spirit of God will begin to empower you in a new way. So right now, just take a moment. Pray a prayer of gratitude, prayer blessing. Call them out as a chosen instrument. Thank the Lord that that individual one day will do great things for the kingdom of God. Thank the Lord that he has put that person in your life so you can be a spring of living water and not a stone. Just take a moment. And then with open hearts and open minds, I'm going to pray for each of you. I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit, in a very unique way, will do for you what was done for Ananias. That your willingness to go to that individual, to enter their house, not with judgment, but with grace and goodness. Not condoning, not condemning. You will discover so much more of the Spirit of God in you. For some of you, you're going to gain a grace for forgiveness that you thought was never possible. For some of you, you are going to gain an authority to speak God's truth in a way you thought was never possible to a family member. Lord Jesus, I thank you for each person who is here, for those who are online. I thank you for the uniqueness of their life. I thank you that each are a chosen instrument. Each carry your name. Lord, you know that individual in our world that you are tapping us on the shoulder for. Holy Spirit, I pray you would fill each of us in a unique way with your presence. For those who need a grace to forgive, would you abundantly pour that grace in? May they be a divine encounter with your grace that they can genuinely forgive and have that spring of living water flow out of them. For those who need to speak God's goodness, Spirit of God, would you empower us with a boldness and a strength? Give us your eyes. Help us to see that person like the recycle flyer. We are here, Lord. We thank you that you tap us on the shoulder. You invite us to join you in a miracle. I pray for each and every person in my voice who has lost hope, for that child, for that loved one, who has lost hope for that coworker, 
Spirit of God, I pray you would just flood us with a hope and a faith that you are at work because you are a God of love that you are very engaged in that person's life. And even if though we may not see it in the natural, we choose to look with eyes of faith. Give us a hope that can come only from you and a faith. We thank you, Lord, that you are at work in their lives and you are at work in our life. Protect us from judging because it just hurts us from seeing your work. Release us that we would be springs of living water for each and every person. We pray this in the special name of Christ. Amen and amen and amen. Listen, before we dismiss, one last comment I want to give to you. There may be some of you here, and as you listen to this story, you said, Joel, I'm not really Ananias. I'm more like Saul. I kind of have this experience, but I don't quite have God figured out. I'm not quite sure who he is or what it's about. And as a church, as leaders, we want to go to you like Ananias came to Saul. We want to help you. We want to pray with you. We want to help you understand. We want to do for you if you're kind of like Saul more in this story. And you can do that really in two ways. One, just text the word hope to 605-405. And our, pastor, our pastors can come to you and help you navigate whatever questions you have. Or truthfully, when this service is done, you can just come down here. I'll be down here. Some of the pastors will be down here. We'll be happy to help you in whatever way we can if that's you. Because there is a real judgment that is coming. And we need to know that so that we can walk in the freedom and the grace of the Lord and we can share that with others. So I pray this week will be an amazing week for you, that you will be full of faith and full of hope, and that as you engage that person that you've been avoiding for the last two months, God will give you such a spring of living water for them that will bring you such joy. Gang, have a great week. We'll see you back here on Sunday. God bless you all. <laughs>